Good to go. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone joining us on the webinar and our uh, audience here in our office. We're very happy to be with you this morning. My name is John Huber and uh, a partner, a shareholder here at Greenberg Trail Rig, which is a mouthful. It's easier to say GT. And uh, we're proud to partner with the World Trade Center Utah today to bring you this important topic. And as we get started talking about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which you need to know about if you are in business uh, internationally, and, uh, and if you're on this call, you are, and if you're associated with the World Trade Center, you are. So uh, one thing I'm really excited about, having been the United States Attorney here in Utah, uh, you know, I served for six years over two administrations, appointed by President Obama, appointed by President Trump, and saw behind the curtain in both those administrations, very happy and pleased to work with all the great professionals in both administrations. Uh, having been in that world and now uh, still residing in Utah, where I am a big ambassador and advocate of Utah, but as Utah grows up and expands internationally with the great business ventures that you're involved in, uh, we need to be aware of what's out there. And so to dial into the network that GT has and the experience that we have, that's why we partnered with the World Trade Center Utah to bring this global platform of 2,500 lawyers from all over the planet, from Shanghai to Tel Aviv and everything in between, to help Utah companies and other companies in the United States benefit from uh, the platform that we offer. And so today I'm very excited to have with me uh, my co-presenters uh, and partners I have from uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, Junaid Hai, who is with us, and he can tell a little bit more about himself as he joins our discussion today, but Junaid uh, distinguishes himself as an expert in compliance measures related to FCPA and has advised and counseled and helped guide a number of very prominent uh, U.S. firms and corporations through these troubled waters uh, that can be related to the FCPA. I also have with me uh, my partner, Dan Wadley. He and I have been friends for many years. And where I came from the Department of Justice, after you know two decades with the Department of Justice, Dan distinguishes himself as a former regional director of the Securities and Exchange Commission here in uh, the Intermountain region and served in a leadership position back in Washington, D.C. with the enforcement arm of the SEC. And he and I work hand in hand, and Junaid and I, uh, the three of us do as well, to help guide companies to stay out of these waters. Because as you see during our discussion today, uh, there, there are some things to be very wary of and some deep water that you can get in. And so as we bring up the next slide, I want to kind of talk about what our goals are today to help you become familiar with the FCPA. This today's presentation is not intended to be like a lawyer presentation for continuing education credit. It's not meant to be that at all. It's meant to be user-friendly to you as uh, leadership uh, in business, business owners, uh, or counselors to businesses to help become familiar with the FCPA. And as we continue to partner with the World Trade Center, I hope that you will look forward to uh, a series of international law topics to help Utah businesses and American businesses become familiar with things that they should be if they are doing business internationally. And so expect notices coming perhaps quarterly from World Trade Center and GT to invite you to participate in these, uh, these discussions that are meant to help you become more sophisticated as you enter into these international markets. So today our goals are to help us all become more familiar with the SCPA. Those are, that's an acronym, those are letters. I mean, the, the, the federal government loves letters. Here's another one, but this one you need to be familiar with because there are uh, enough issues, as you will see, that this could really become a very heavy weight upon you if you get in the focus or the crosshairs of the FCPA. So, um, one of the things we'll talk about with our background, Dan being an expert in the SEC, which is very active and has historically been very active in uh, FCPA enforcement on the civil end. And my own experience, 20 years at DOJ and being in the leadership at DOJ 
over the course of two administrations. Today, I will talk a little bit about what the dangers are, the focus is uh, relating to the Department of Justice uh, in the United States. Junaid will offer his extensive experience with you know, how to stay out of trouble or to get out of trouble if those crosshairs do fall upon you. And he will give you some proven methods and to help you appreciate what you can do right now to not even get in this water. You don't want to. And that's a message that we're going to bring to you and give you ideas of how you can do that. Uh, and then, you know, the essence of it, as you will learn, is about bribery and corruption. And uh, we'll, we'll help, we'll talk about how you can handle allegations if it does come up, or if you get a subpoena from the SEC, or if, uh, you know, if, if a federal agent knocks on your door or asks to talk to you or someone in the company. So that's our game plan today. And I'd like uh, to maybe transition over and have Junaid talk about uh, getting into, let's understand more what the FCPA is. Hello, everyone. Hello to everyone in the room. Hello to everyone on the webinar. It's a, a pleasure to be here in Salt Lake City. Um, I have to say, first and foremost, uh, sitting between two incredible public servants who have now left the government and have joined GT, um, it's everyone's loss but our gain. So it's uh, an honor to be uh, in the room with both John and Dan. As John mentioned, my practice is primarily anti-corruption work, and that means two things. Um, one, conducting internal investigations when there is an allegation of wrongdoing, which we, of course, hope never happens. And the first part uh, to do that is to do uh, to design, build, and help implement compliance programs so that hopefully you don't have to have an internal investigation. So we'll kind of cover later in this uh, presentation what effective compliance looks like uh, and what to do if you do get in trouble. But let's start with some of the basics, and I'm going to keep this very high level uh, in terms of the law itself. Um, and the FCPA. And so the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act applies under statute to four different types of entities. And I'm not going to go over this in detail. That's for uh, all the lawyers. Let me just say, first and foremost, if you operate in the United States, if you have employees in the United States, um, if you do any type of activity in the United States, the FCPA is going to apply to your entity or to you individually. I once had uh, the privilege of talking with a then senior DOJ uh, administrator, uh, administrator, and he said to me, if you transact in dollars, those dollars will come to the United States, and we say we have jurisdiction. Um, so the U.S. government, over particularly the last uh, 10 to 15 years, has taken a very broad view of jurisdiction when it comes to the FCPA, which is, can be a little scary, but most times what we advise is, when in doubt, you have to take the position that FCPA will apply uh, to you and to your organization. So what does the FCPA require? Uh, well, two things. There's two provisions. The first one is pretty simple. Don't bribe. Uh, and when we get to the next slide in a minute, we'll talk about what that actually means under the law, because most of us have a sense of what that may mean, uh, you, know, you know, in our daily lives or what we see in movies or on TV. Um, but we'll talk about what the definition of bribery is under the FCPA. And the second piece of uh, the FCPA is the accounting provisions. And, and Dan will talk about that in a few slides. But that really comes down to keeping accurate books and records and maintaining internal controls. And one of the things that's interesting in this space, the vast majority of cases actually get resolved on the accounting provisions, on the books and records. It's much easier for the US government to prove the books and records violations than it is to prove the bribery allegations. And so uh, even though the bribery conduct usually gets the headlines, it's the books and records or the lack of internal controls that ultimately lead to a company and to individuals getting in trouble. <clears throat> On the next slide, let's go and talk a little bit more about what that anti-bribery provision actually entails. And so I'm just going to give you the, the, the law here. What the anti-bribery provision prohibits, it prohibits offering, promising, authorizing, paying money, or anything of value, which we'll talk about in a second, to a foreign official. And when I say foreign official, I mean foreign from a U.S. standpoint, so a non-U.S. governmental official, to influence an act or decision of that foreign official 
basically to secure an improper advantage or obtain a retained business. So let's break that down because that there's a lot there. So the first thing is let's talk about what a bribe is. Um, and usually I think, you know, people have the viewpoint, you see it on movies or TV, um, or if you, you know, watch uh, the American Greed series on um, CNBC, you'll see bribery. And how does it always portrayed? It's usually a guy in a dark suit like myself in a basement parking garage with, you know, a bag of cash and a, you know, dark car rolls up and window goes down and the bag gets put in the car or the trunk. And, you know, that's, that's the bribery. Well, that's not the way it happens. Um, and that's typically not the way it happens. Bribery can be the payment of money and it can be the payment of cash. But it can also be, as we see from the statute, it can be offering money. So simply offering a bribe or money or a thing of value to a government official can potentially cause uh, liability and culpability for an organization. What do we mean in terms of offering or promising? That's when or authorizing. That's when you may use a third party to pay the bribe on your behalf. And that's the most common, as we'll talk about a little later. Most companies are not brazen enough, um, or we can use some other words, to actually pay the bribe themselves. They'll often use a third party to facilitate that payment. So they'll authorize the third party to make the bribe uh, on their behalf. And worldwide, there was a study a few years ago by the OECD that showed over 75% of worldwide bribery cases involved a third party committing, uh, you know, sending the money or paying the money. The second part, let's talk about what anything of value means. It's not just cash. It can be uh, travel. It can be discounts. It can be concessions. It can be offers of employment, uh, as we've seen in cases that Dan will talk about a little bit later. Uh, the idea, particularly of Prince Links, um, was a series of cases where it was offers of employment to folks that were related to government officials um, and giving them either ghost positions or highly inflated titles and salaries because you're trying to curry favor with that government official. So it's not just money. It really is anything that would be deemed valuable to that government official. The third part is the foreign official. And for the most part, people have a good understanding of what a foreign official is under the FCPA. And it certainly is you know, anyone that is in a government position, a minister uh, uh, in, a, in a country, a, a mayor, you know, it's something at the municipal level. The one thing that most people don't think about in this space is foreign official is much broader in many of the countries that you all will operate in. So for example, um, healthcare. You know, in the United States, healthcare has both a public and a private facing component. In many countries overseas, healthcare is government run, which means hospital administrators, doctors are all foreign officials under the FCPA. So there was a case a few years ago where a medical device company was going around bribing doctors to use their equipment and use their services. And that was a violation under the FCPA because those doctors are foreign officials. And the last piece here is, what does it mean to influence an act or decision of official? And there's really two components of this. There's the piece where you're inducing the foreign official to do something that they shouldn't do. Um, and that is, the, the classic example is a license or a permit. So for example, in the construction piece, right? It's, are you getting a, um, a zoning change? Are you getting a construction permit when maybe you have not met all the legal requirements to get that license or permit? The second thing is when you're inducing that government official to fail to take the action that they're supposed to take. That typically happens in the fines and penalties uh, component. So the classic example there is, you know, if you're violating some local law uh, in a country that you're operating in and the government official comes and is about to levy a fine or a penalty and you offer a pay or bribe so that you don't get the fine or penalty. So, that's the anti-bribery provision without getting too much into the legalese. And, and Dan will now cover uh, the accounting provisions component. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so as John mentioned, I'm Dan Wadley and, and um, I spent time at, at the SEC and the enforcement division as the regional director um, here in Salt Lake and in a position in Washington, DC. As part of that position, I was part of the FCPA unit, the SEC's FCPA unit. I was an assistant director there and, and as a result had, a, had a, just a 
a, a really good opportunity to get to know this area um, intimately. As Jeanne said, um, you know these these questions about you know who is a who is a foreign official and and what constitutes a bribe can get very thorny. And um, you know, for instance, um, he, he kind of mentioned the the print these princeling what we call the princeling cases. Um, we brought several cases against Deutsche Bank and others where um, they were hiring um, the the children and near relations of you know these government officials in China and elsewhere um, in an effort to try to curry you know curry favor and get and get awards of certain contracts. Um, not traditional, as Junaid said, not traditional um, scenarios that one would ordinarily think of of a bribe. And the other thing that's so important is is many of the many of the behaviors that underlie an FCPA action that what what is determined to be kind of this improper conduct is considered entirely appropriate outside of um, the foreign official area. And so, for instance, you know, if you're in the pharmaceutical area and you wanted doctors in the United States to use your, you know, use take advantage and use your particular pharma pharmaceuticals, it would not be in, in any way unusual to provide certain benefits to these doctors to build these relationships to try and, and provide a scenario where the doctor would take advantage of, of whatever particular drug you had. Entirely appropriate, you know, apparently here in the United States, outside of the United States with a foreign official, all of a sudden it becomes a concern and, and potentially a violation of the FCPA. So that's so. Jeanne was talking about the the anti-bribery provision, Section 30A, um, is what is the provision that typically prohibits that that unlawful and you know unlawful conduct. The anti what they call the anti-bribery provisions. In addition to that, companies and all company, all public companies, not just in the FCPA context, all public companies have an obligation to maintain accurate books and records and to implement internal controls necessary to ensure, um, ensure that the you know, certain activities and behaviors within a company are conducted appropriately. These are two separate provisions falling under section 13 of, you know, of the Exchange Act. So let's talk about each one. Accurate books and records requires, this accurate books and records provision requires the company literally maintain, as it says, an accurate accounting, accurate record reflecting the financial transactions of a particular company. The internal controls provisions are to ensure, not just in the FCPA space, but kind of throughout the company, that, that the, the financial activity of that particular company are, are legitimate and are, are being appro necessarily approved by the management of the company. Where this comes into place in the FCPA, and, and in, interestingly enough, it's my understanding that both of these provisions were actually implemented as part of the FCPA law back in the 1970s, but now is, are, is much more broad. But where these come into place in the FCPA is, is where a company is engaged internationally and may have um, employees or partners internationally who, who might uh, be running afoul of the FCPA, whether it's providing you know, these benefits, these bribes, whatever it is, attempting to curry favor. Oftentimes it's using slush funds, Ill, you know, illicit funds to, you know, to, to, make these, um, to make these payments or arrange this travel or whatever it might be. Oftentimes those are not accounted for as bribes. Um, not surprisingly, right? So, so for instance, um, you know, travel and entertainment, um, you know, they may incur these expenses on the travel and entertainment side, providing travel to these foreign officials or foreign officials' families to travel to the United States or elsewhere for, you know, not, you know, trips that are unrelated to the business itself. Um, and knowing that that could potentially be a violation of the FCPA, oftentimes, um, the company or the employees will conceal the nature of that travel. So rather than listing it as an improper you know, benefit given to this foreign official and their family, they will put it down as a legitimate expense, mischaracterize it, mis, you know, mischaracterize it within the, within the expense records. And all of a sudden you have a violation of the books and records provision of the, of the securities laws. Whether or not 
the underlying travel constitutes a bribe, you still have a separate violation of the books and records provision of the federal securities laws. The internal controls provisions are similar. So if, if an individual and their family was, you know, was, was transported from China or from India or from wherever to the United States to go to Disneyland, and even if that underlying conduct ultimately is determined to not be improper, if the company had failed to implement necessary internal controls to ensure that that travel was appropriately vetted, considered, and, and, then, and then ultimately approved, if the company didn't have those internal controls in place, that could still constitute a violation of the internal controls provisions of the federal securities laws. And as Junaid said, oftentimes it's difficult to prove up an actual bribe case because of the elements there. It has to be corrupt. There has to be intent. There's oftentimes there's complicated business relationships between the U.S.-based company and a foreign subsidiary. You know whether it's whether it's a wholly owned subsidiary or a joint venture. Oftentimes there are issues of control as to whether or not the U.S.-based issue or the U.S.-based listed company actually has control over the ultimate conduct that is taking place in this far-flung area. And because of that control issue, sometimes it's difficult to actually prove the, the necessary bribery charge to hold the US-based company accountable. But because the accounting provisions and the internal control provisions apply irrespective of that control relationship, if the, if the financial accounting of that foreign subsidiary still flow up into the US-based company, oftentimes, even if there's a, a kind of what would be a break in the control issues such that it would be difficult to prove the underlying bribery charge, those accounting provisions and internal controls provisions will still apply. And so oftentimes you'll see in resolutions, certainly at the DOJ and, and the ones that I'm familiar with at the SEC, you will see cases where they will allege improper conduct um, taking place in one of these foreign jurisdictions by a U.S. company or U.S. company subsidiaries that ultimately will be resolved without a bribery charge, a 38 charge, but instead will be resolved on a, an internal accounting um, provisions charge and, and oftentimes a books and records charge because those are much easier to prove. And so, so even if the company can avoid you know, what is, is of serious concern to, you know, a, for a company which is showing corrupt behavior by its employees, oftentimes they will still be on the hook for significant penalties. One was just announced yesterday by the SEC, this, the Oracle case, it's the second FCPA case against Oracle, where um, Oracle is alleged to have engaged in providing improper travel by use of these slush funds, to these foreign officials, bringing them to the United States, providing side, even if they were here for legitimate conferences, providing side trips, you know, for these for these government employees to take, um, it, using these slush funds. Oracle, it's again alleged, violated the books and records and internal controls provisions of the federal securities laws, and as a result, is paying eight million dollars in disgorgement and fifteen million dollars in penalties. And that's oftentimes what you'll see in these FCPA cases is the, and we'll talk about later is the is the penalties and and disgorgement numbers can become significant can, can become significant for a company. If we'll go to the next slide, we'll talk about the trends in FCPA enforcement. I think this kind of leads right into that. So when we when we talk about the nature of of the penalties and disgorgement in FCPA cases. Most of the time, they are significantly greater than the underlying violative conduct. And it's, and it's different than you'll see in other cases. In an insider trading case, you know, somebody goes out and, and places in, improper trades and makes, and makes a bunch of money based on insider information, the SEC or the Department of Justice will ask for that, that amount to come back, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars or the millions of dollars that, that were made. And, in the, in, in the insider trading, and then a, a relatively commensurate penalty with it. You know, if there's a, an offering fraud or some kind of, you know, some kind of other financial fraud by companies, oftentimes you'll see 
the, the penalties and disgorgements are in close relation to the actual conduct itself. In the FCPA space, on the other hand, they can be significantly greater. And so you can, you can imagine um, in an oil field in Nigeria and you know, an, an oil company wanting to get access to these oil fields in you know, this area, and they provide a fairly modest, what would be considered a fairly modest bribe to a government official in this particular jurisdiction to get access to this oil field you know, a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, something, you know, something fairly modest, but as a result generates significant revenue to the company because of the oil that they're able to access and so forth. The penalties are, and, and the disgorgement are, are, are in relation to the revenue that was generated and the profits that were generated from the activity, not the bribe itself. And that's where companies can get into significant trouble you know these you know, these very modest hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars in in the what would would be considered bribes can result in millions and millions and millions of dollars in penalties. And so, if we look at the trends in FCPA enforcement, the first is the corporate enforcement. Big penalties remain the concern for companies. These these significant penalties, tens of millions of dollars in the Oracle case, um, another couple of cases involving Deutsche Bank that I was involved with. Again, joint case with the Department of Justice, you know, $80 million in penalties to, to Deutsche Bank. They can be significant penalties, multi-jurisdictional. Because of the nature of the FCPA and, and the fact that it always involves, almost always involves bribery in foreign jurisdictions in multinational corporations, oftentimes you'll see activity in in Mexico and in the Middle East and in India and in China and in Russia with the same underlying conduct. Other US, you know, besides the SEC and the Department of Justice, other agencies can get into the act and also foreign agencies get into the act. Oftentimes there will be coordination between the US-based agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission in my case, and foreign and foreign government agencies to coordinate the investigation. And oftentimes there will be multi- um, multi-jurisdictional resolutions of the underlying conduct itself. Repeat offenders, we mentioned the Oracle case that was just announced yesterday. The press release itself noted that this was the second FCPA violation by this particular company they labeled or Oracle a recidivist. Oftentimes a monitor will be proposed by the government agency, especially in the case of a repeat offender, because now the government agency doesn't have confidence in the and the ability of that entity or that issuer to actually implement those internal controls and those books and records to maintain those books and records necessary. So they will implement a monitor who will scrutinize the activity for a period of time of the business to ensure that it's complying with, this, with the securities laws and with the FCPA. No company wants to have a monitor constantly looking over its shoulder, second guessing every decision that's made, incurring significant expenses um, to ensure compliance with the securities laws. Individual enforcement, it's not just companies that are on the hook. The SEC, the Department of Justice, prefers in every case they can to tag a responsible individual in addition to the company. And so that was a question that would be asked all the time when we would propose, at the SEC, would propose resolutions in many of our cases. It was, that's great that we're going after the company, where are the individuals? Why do we not have it? Companies don't act on their own. They act through individuals. Where are the individuals that should be, that should be tagged for this? The, the next bullet point, more FCPA related offenses referencing my, money laundering and wire fraud. The same teams or the same kind of, the same teams that will look at FCPA will then expand that out. And, and it's no surprise that that related violations like money laundering and wire fraud oftentimes get implicated in that same in that same underlying conduct. And so all of a sudden, you're not just as a company, you're not just looking at the potential FCPA violation, which can be significant, but you're looking at expanded violations as well. The money laundering obviously is a, is a serious one these days. Department of Justice, SEC guidelines. John's going to walk us through some of the Department of Justice kind of priorities and what and the direction they're going. Then I'll kind of visit where, where the SEC appears to be going in this area. These are, these are obviously, um, I think, important considerations for companies to, to think about as they, as they evaluate their foreign footprint. 
Okay, so let's advance the slide. <clears throat> and uh, so I'd like to just take a minute and talk about the Department of Justice. You know, I uh, mentioned I worked there for 20 years, six of those as a, a leader in the department appointed by uh, presidents of two parties. Um, and now, uh, you know, we're into the Biden administration. And so we saw a shift during the Trump administration away from the imposition of monitors. And uh, that was frankly applauded by the business community. Uh, but we do now see, as Dan mentioned, a return to those monitor ships. And there's some other things that have changed with the Biden administration that you should definitely be aware of. First off, uh, the Biden administration has, has really been talking tough about foreign corruption issues. And it st started very early on in President Biden's administration. He issued an executive memo directing the applicable federal agencies to really step up on foreign corruption issues and uh, you know, gave specific instructions to return and report what their plans would be, what their strategies would be. And you know, if you read that, wherever you may be on the political spectrum, that memo from President Biden was hard to argue with because as Americans, we try to, you know, we aspire. For over 200 years, we've been seeking a more perfect union and we're not quite there to perfection for sure, but we strive for it. And we set ourselves like, you know, to, to wax eloquent, like a city upon a hill and establish ourselves as this is a corruption free place. This is where business plays on an even playing field according to the rule of law, which governs our contractual relations and how we do business with one another. Those values extend out beyond our territorial boundaries. And that's reflected directly in the FCPA that when we do business abroad, we will still hold ourselves to a higher standard than perhaps those prospective business partners or government agencies may hold themselves out to be in those other lands. So President Biden issued very strong language uh, early last year to say, let's do a better job. And the basic theory is that if we are um, tolerant of corruption type behavior in our business dealings abroad, that will seep back into our business dealings here. And we lose, um, we lose the protection that our borders, uh, our physical and uh, figurative borders afford us with the rule of law that we benefit from in the United States. When President Biden issued those in clear instructions, uh, he did focus on some particular areas that you should be aware of. Now the FCP, a applies around the globe. And there are high risk areas if you're doing business in certain places in Asia, the Middle East, um, uh, Southeast Asia or Latin America, there are some high risk places that you should be aware of. And you, know, you could name off a couple right now, just not even thinking very deeply about it. But President Biden did bring particular focus upon and asked executive agencies like the Department of Justice to focus upon Central America, Latin America, and particular areas within Central America. The Northern Triangle is a term that's used, a descriptive term of a region in Central America. So be aware that that is a particular focus that is put at the top of the list, not that the others are not on the list. At the top of the list, uh, it, you know, you're going to get most attention. So if a stack of cases comes into the FCPA unit or into a U.S. attorney's office, if it generates from Central America, that will go to the top of the list as far as who's going to work it and how fast they're going to work it. Another dynamic that you have seen with the Biden administration and the Department of Justice within the administration is a rewrite. Uh, a rewrite of corporate accountability and credit for cooperation. So within less than a year, so last December and just a few weeks ago, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and so that is like if the AG, if the Attorney General is the CEO of the Department of Justice, the Deputy Attorney General is the COO of the Department of Justice. And she, Lisa Monaco, uh, issue, has issued some directions that 
has rewritten and brought back some things that during the Trump administration were either done away with or put to the side or certainly not emphasized. And one of those things is corporate accountability. So whereas during the Trump administration, uh, there was an emphasis on bringing forth the individuals, the bad actors who were actually doing the bribes. And that's that's the dynamic that you have to deal with and be aware of, that if you here in Utah or in the United States, safely within the confines of our mountain sanctuary, are doing everything above board and everything that you should to, to obey the law of the land, you may have an agent of your business in Mexico or the Philippines or elsewhere who doesn't have those same values and says, well, they do they do it this way here. I'm going to do it this way here. I'm going to make this decision based on this company. That's a bad actor. And if you discover a bad actor, uh, there were times when you would be given credit for bringing that person forward, helping provide the evidence and the background investigation that you had already done to get that bad apple out of the basket. And then DOJ is not going to focus so much on you. Well, those policies have changed under this administration, and it is much harder to get credit for cooperation. And so, you know, critics look at that and say, well, isn't that counterintuitive that if you want um, U.S. corporations to bring the bad apples forward, and yet you're still not just going to slap them on the hand, you're going to you know, <laughs> put their arm behind their back and put, you know, some very heavy penalties on them, that may disincentivize uh corporations from bringing cases and bad apples forward. So that is a change in this administration. And if you couple that with what I'll call COVID fog, and you know, you describe that how you will, but things are very different. And we're coming out of it. I mean, we're here in live in a conference room. We uh, act, uh, you know, very normal pre-COVID type normal when we're traveling now. Things have changed. And yet that COVID fog, to be frank, still hangs over the Department of Justice. And so, for example, I was talking to a good friend and contact uh, who works in the Department of Justice, Main Justice Building in Washington, D.C. yesterday, who described to me what I already knew to be true, that those halls of justice are empty. People are not in the office. And that extends out to the individual United States Attorney's offices, which are like the base camps of the Department of Justice throughout the nation that very few people are coming to the office. They're relying on like what we're doing today, technology. And technology is great, but it only goes so far when you're trying to build a very complicated case uh, against uh, you know, suspects who you think have committed or engaged in very complicated behavior. So that has led to maybe a lack of productivity in the first two years of the Biden administration that even though these, this tough talk has been, you know, repeatedly waving that flag and giving that speech about tough talk and that accountability is coming, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen it on the ground. We haven't, you know, seen them uh, bring those indictments or those SEC complaints like they have been touting. And I'm giving you some uh, suggestions as to why that may be. And if you take this next bullet, this delay, and there's always a lag between administrations. You know, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. But when we transition between administrations, there is a definite lag. And uh, through my 20 years at the department, I, I worked through a number of administrations and there is a lag from the, the team going out and the new team coming in and really fully implementing their priorities and objectives. This has been extra long. And the best example of that, having been a United States attorney, there's 93 United States attorneys in the country. And, uh, you know, in the Intermountain West, it's one to one. There's one U.S. attorney to one state of Utah or state of Idaho. But, you know, you can imagine in more populous uh, states like California, there's four United States attorneys. Well, it's take California. Only two of those four United States attorneys have been appointed by President Biden and confirmed by the United States Senate. The other two are manned by placeholders. This is a challenge. And that dynamic extends out across the Department of Justice that you have just over 50% of the United States attorneys have been appointed by President Obama across the country. And what that means is, look, leadership matters. You know that in your corporation. And if you kind of compare, try to make it an apple to apple comparison, which isn't quite accurate, but you have a, the Department of Justice, which is 115,000 employees, public servants who are motivated, who want to do the right thing, 
who want to make a difference for good in their communities without a leader and uh, taking the priorities of the administration and getting the water to the end of each of those rows in those 93 U.S. attorney offices, look, it's just not going to happen. And that explains why, although there's been tough talk and assertions, we have not seen the proof in the pudding that they're going to bring these cases. That being said, we do anticipate and assess that the second half of the Biden administration, which we're now entering, we will see more enforcement actions along the lines of FCPA. Whereas just a few months ago, uh, I heard from the FCPA unit and them saying, look, COVID has not taken a toll on us. We are as productive as we ever been. Look, I left the department a year ago and I knew what it was like amidst COVID and it was hard. It was hard to reach that level of productivity that we should have from our public servants. That being said, this next two years, I think you can anticipate that this tough talk will take the form of more enforcement actions in the FCPA uh, environment. So now we'd like to have Dan talk about similar trends that he's observed having just left the SEC. As we transition though to this next slide, I want you to know that we will have a few minutes at the end for Q&A. And we're here, it's our time is yours, which is unusual for a law office, it's yours. And if you have some questions or particular points that you'd like some more information on, please type into the chat uh, on the, the chat function on the webinar questions and we'll have our moderator share those with us. And we have some live audience members here too who can offer those questions and we'll devote some time to that if you'd like. So let's have Dan talk about FC, SEC trends. So it, even, thanks, John, even before getting that, Junaid, so junaid has been keyed into this area for years now um, as, on, on the private practice side, you know, hearing what John is talking about with the Department of Justice, kind of that lull, what's, what's, what's your view of that? What, looking at it from the, from the private practice side, the defense side? I think what we've seen is oftentimes with FCPA cases, it's a time capsule because it takes so long to actually get resolved and into the public sphere. So we are hearing the tough talk from the Department of Justice. Those enforcement actions won't come to light for a couple more years. So we've been through the transition. We're starting to hear more activity coming out of uh, the Department of Justice. I'm certainly hearing from our clients that there's more awareness uh, you know, about FCPA issues. And so I do anticipate that we'll see more cases Come, you know, come to resolution over the next few years. But unfortunately, it's a little bit of a time capsule. So we'll still see some cases that were remnants from the previous administration uh, that will get settled over the next year or two. And then we'll start to see kind of the new cases that have been bubbling up at the beginning of the Biden administration get resolved and enforced. And we'll hear about those publicly over the next couple of years. So I think we'll, we'll certainly see, and people are anticipating, our clients are anticipating more activity and we're hearing more activity from the beginning of the cases and the beginning of the cycle. Yeah, the, the discovery of these cases takes a while, oftentimes. A company, even upon discovering it, oftentimes has to just figure, kind of figure out itself, okay, what exactly happened? They have to decide whether to self-report. Oftentimes there might be a whistleblower that brings it to the attention of the Department of Justice or the SEC. So there is inevitably a certain period, you know, kind of oftentimes a lag before it starts to get traction. And so I think that time capsule it is exactly right. It's, it's kind of what these cases are. And it's not unusual to see a resolution of a case many years after the underlying conduct, five, six years after the underlying conduct, which I think is a concern because I think the agencies want to timely address these things, but just the realities of discovery and investigation and discussion and negotiation it just, just takes time. So, all right, so SEC enforcement trends. Um, the, as John indicated from the Department of Justice, the SEC continues to state that it will aggressively investigate and police foreign corruption. The good news for companies that don't love the SEC looking over your shoulder, the good news for companies is that the SEC currently has an awful lot on its plate. You'll see in the press references to ESG, the environmental, social, and government's kind of initiatives that the SEC is, is kind of taking. You hear an awful lot about crypto. Just this past year, the SEC doubled its crypto unit, enforcement unit, which is the unit that is 
designated to investigate cyber related conduct you know anything from you know coins to exchanges whatever it is they've doubled the size of that unit so a lot of the sec's attention and resources right now is kind of channeled in this esg focus and in the kind of what that colloquial term the crypto focus so that's the good news, right? Um, the, is that there's a, a lot on this plate that only has you know finite resources, and a lot of that seems to be going toward these kind of hot button issues. The bad news, of course, is they still have an FCPA unit. They have not diverted resources from the FCPA unit to these others. It is still, you know, it's still there. It's still churning away, and. And the SEC's whistleblower program is still in, in place. So let's talk real, real briefly about that whistleblower program. Back in 2010, as part of what was the, what's called the Dodd-Frank Act, the SEC, the, legislatively, the SEC was given whist, whistleblower authority. And so to incentivize individuals to come in and literally blow the whistle on, on violations that they, that they learn about. So employees, individuals, whoever receives knowledge can go to the SEC and, 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 and register as a whistleblower and provide information to the SEC that would potentially, um, potentially create a scenario where an investigation comes up. And then if at the conclusion of that investigation, the SEC brings an enforcement action where an award is given, the SEC will take 20 to 30 percent proportionally, not from the award, but 20 to 30 percent of that award and pay it to the whistleblower. So that's one thing if it's a, you know, a, a modest, you know, financial fraud involving two to three million dollars and the whistleblower gets a couple of hundred thousand dollars. It's in, it's entirely different in the FCPA space where you have 100 and 200 million dollar awards and for an employee to know that if I'm a whistleblower to the SEC, you know, on in this FCPA context, knowing that if if an a hundred million dollar award is given, I stand to benefit ten to thirty million dollars from that award. These employees and and related individuals are highly motivated to be a whistleblower, and so so while while there is a lot of attention being focused on these other areas. The FCPA unit is still intact. The whistleblower you know, program is still there. Individuals are still incentivized to bring, the, to bring the conduct to the attention of the regulator. And as a result, it's not something that companies can simply be comfortable saying the SEC is preoccupied elsewhere. It remains an issue. It's a priority for the agency. Foreign corruption remains a priority. So companies need to be vigilant in this area. So that's the first thing. The second bullet point is that, as we've kind of referenced already, the SEC and the Department of Justice, certainly the SEC, continues to look at non-traditional avenues of what could, could potentially be foreign corruption. So the bolts here, travel and entertainment, the princeling cases that we talked about, these improper hires, vendors and slush funds. Let's talk about that briefly. So oftentimes, companies will operate internationally with the, with the benefit or assistance of partners within a particular jurisdiction, call them vendors that will help to arrange relationships, provide services, make connections and so forth. And oftentimes those vendors will be paid, you know, some kind of fee for the services that they're providing, of course. If those vendors in that relationship themselves are using some of those funds improperly to influence foreign government officials, mm -hmm. That relationship, even though it's not direct from the company to the foreign official, but rather indirect through the vendor to that foreign official, that conduct, nevertheless, can also constitute a violation of the FCPA. Now, so even, even, if, the, even if the vendor is providing, ostensibly providing um, legitimate services, either with knowledge or oftentimes you know turning a blind eye to it if the vendor in which is generally speaking an entity in that jurisdiction not a us based entity but an entity in that jurisdiction is providing is is doing something illicit that can still constitute a violation of the fcpa for purposes of the us based company something certainly to be aware of 
policing that relationship between partners within a jurisdiction becomes, becomes essential. The last one, conferences and side trips. This is one that I have seen now coming to the surface on a number of occasions. So imagine a scenario where you have doctors in China, um, you have a product that you want to educate them on, you provide a conference in the United States, you bring the doctors to the United States for this conference. So far, so good. Nothing of concern in this if, if the conference is legitimate. While they're here, you pay for side trips. For instance, if the conference is in New York City, you pay for a side trip to go down to Washington, D.C. to become a tourist. You pay a side trip to go to Disneyland and or Disney World in Orlando. All of a sudden, the side trips themselves become a concern, even if the initial conference or, or you know, whatever else that you brought them here for, even if that wouldn't be a concern under the FCPA, all of a sudden, the provision of these side trips and other benefits becomes of concern. So, you, so it's, it's essential, again, that you scrutinize the entire operation and relationship. And again, those doctors, as Junaid said, in China are, are oftentimes determined to be government employees and therefore subject to the provisions of the FCPA. Whereas if these doctors were in France or, or Germany, may not have that same consideration because they're not considered government employees in that particular jurisdiction. So being aware of, of the relationship, that government relationship between um, the individuals you're working with in a particular jurisdiction becomes essential. We've talked about internal controls already, obviously. Um, it's, essential, it's essential to understand that, that what falls under the internal controls provision is, is continually being expanded. And so, for instance, we, we referenced the provision of bribes to a government official, even if we can't prove that that was a bribe, but it was improperly recorded in the books and records constitutes a violation of the books and records provisions. Even if the individual isn't a government employee and it's still recorded improperly in your books and records, that will still constitute a violation of the internal controls or the accounting provisions of the federal securities laws. And so you can imagine a scenario where um, where a whistleblower brings to the attention of the SEC certain conduct going on, say it's in China involving doctors, the SEC conducts an investigation, they start to scrub it down, they find, they find conduct that they believe is improper, but ultimately determine that that particular doctor isn't a government employee because it's a private hospital in China. But nevertheless, the conduct itself had been recorded improperly in the company's books and records. We don't have a violation of Section 30A. There's not, an, there's not a bribery charge that the SEC can bring, but it will likely still bring a charge under the books and records provisions of the securities laws, even though the individual um, uh, you know, with, with that underlying conduct was not a government official. So you have to understand that those books and records provisions and the internal controls provisions apply even if the underlying Section 30A conduct you know, that bribery, that foreign official doesn't apply. The last thing we'll talk about is the is the expanded attention of the SEC into the into the anti money laundering area. The Department of Justice has direct jurisdiction over AML. The SEC doesn't. Um, they uh, unless it's a unless it's a regulated entity like a broker dealer or you know investment advisor. Nevertheless. If a company is representing to its investors that it has implemented proper internal controls in these areas, and it turns out, as it is in many of these cases, that they have been conducting improper activity in a foreign jurisdiction, the SEC may still bring a controls case or a case based on the based on the misrepresentations regarding those internal controls, based on the misrepresentations that are made by a company. So these are these are kind of priorities for the SEC. This is where the SEC seems to be going. It's kind of an exciting exciting time in the SEC regulatory environment. Junaid, I will let's advance the slides and have Junaid kind of roll us to the end of this. He's got some great stuff. Let's go one more. All right. So what can we do to avoid all the bad stuff we've just been talking about? And I'll give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is the DOJ and SEC have actually given us a blueprint. Of course, the bad news is they expect you to follow it. So um, that's the good and the bad. And 
So the DOJ and SEC, I'll go uh, over this list a little, uh, you know, somewhat quickly in terms of what they expect. The hallmarks of effective compliance. And there are really some key ones here that I want to focus on. One is it certainly starts uh, with the tone at the top, with the commitment from senior management. If you don't have that, uh, and if the DOJ and SEC see, see that you don't have that, then you really can't have an effective compliance program. Uh, and that's one of the things that the DOJ and SEC have said consistently. Another one that I'll focus on uh, is really, it comes kind of hand in hand, the anti-corruption policies and procedures. Everyone thinks they know what that means. Having a paper policy is not going to work. Having a generic policy and then having no procedures to make sure that you actually implement those procedures so that you're not running afoul of the policy, that doesn't work as well. So you need to have both policies and procedures. And so what are the things that you start with? We often talk about starting with a risk assessment. What does your company's risk profile look like? Where are you working? Where are you operating? Are you using third parties? As we see here on the slide, doing third party due diligence is very important. You know, as we talked about at the beginning, the 75% of cases involve third parties. So know who your third parties are. When you're assessing your risk, where are you, not only where are you operating, but what industries, what types of joint ventures, what types of subsidiary, subsidiary activity do you have? And so uh, a couple of things that I'll highlight here, you know, do you have a training uh, cadence, a training uh, policy in place so that your employees, especially new employees, uh, get to know what your policies and procedures are? And then you know, do you have the incentive and disciplinary measures in place? In other words, do you have, um, you know, we have one client that ties the, their compliance matrix to the top end executive compensation every single year. Um, that's a pretty good incentive. Do you have reporting <clears throat> an internal investigation uh, metric involved? I'll say, I, I like to steal this line. Compliance is not like the movies. Silence is not golden. If you're not hearing things from your employees, as the father of a nine and seven year old, my wife and I know if we don't hear anything from the kids when they're in the basement, there's some bad things going on down there. Uh, there's some trouble brewing. So silence is not golden. You want to be hearing from the operations out in the foreign country. So the hallmarks of effective compliance are really important for all of us. It's great that we have them. Um, the DOJ and SEC have given them to us. And of course, we have to follow them. We're going to go ahead and skip to the next slide, which I'll cover very briefly. Um, and then we'll, we have one more slide after this. So there's three components that the DOJ and SEC have really um, said or make an effective compliance program. And there's three fundamental questions. Is it well-designed? Then do you have the adequate resources and have empowered the right people to function effectively? And then third, does it work in practice? So I mentioned, that means risk assessments. Can't just be a snapshot in time. Are you looking at data and data utilization from data that you get from other parts of your business as a compliance program? And then finally, what are the lessons learned? If you're doing all this compliance work or doing a risk assessment and then you're not updating your program periodically, then you're not getting the benefits of that risk assessment. I'll quickly go through here in the, in the last minute and a half or so, um, just a quick case example. So on the last slide here, um, if we have, uh, if you do have an allegation of bribery, what do you do? Let me give you a quick case example. There was a, um, a case that involved a U.S.-based company that was building a campus in India, and the allegation was that they were using third parties to bribe in the construction licensing and permitting process. They received a $25 million settlement with the SEC, but the DOJ declined prosecution and listed six primary reasons, and five of these you actually have in your control. One is that they voluntary, voluntarily disclosed within two weeks of the <clears throat> board learning about the conduct, meaning they acted quickly, the board took action right away. Second, they conducted a thorough and comprehensive investigation. And then third, they proactively went ahead and cooperated with the government. So there's the internal um, investigation piece. One, uh, the fourth one is that they had an effective uh, compliance program before the bad conduct occurred, and they'd already taken steps to enhance their program. Uh, and then they disciplined and terminated the employees that were alleged to have committed the bad conduct. So it was quick activity, 
they had an existing program, which is one of the things we obviously stress, and then they, um, you know, disciplined and terminated the employees. I mean, the last one, hopefully we're all in this category, that they, the company lacked prior criminal history. Now, if you don't have that as one of your bullet points, you still have the other five things that you can do uh, as part of a compliance program. So it's really making sure you're being proactive on the front end, and then if bad things do occur, that you have uh, actions that you can take to make sure that you don't um, continue the bad conduct. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Dan. We're, we're coming up to our time. We know your time is valuable. Did we have any questions from the chat? But we've got a question from the chat and, and live audience. We will take a second. We can talk with you guys after for sure. What's the question from the chat? Um, so Terrence Delaney in the chat asked, any comments regarding standard legal slash ethical practice within the USA in specific industries, medical, pharmaceutical, that would be in FCPA violation when conducting business globally? So I think the, the main one there is uh, discounts um, and concessions are treated differently here. So um, oftentimes what we see is you'll have a company that has a discount policy and a delegation of authority for those discounts. So, you know, a 5% discount is fine. A 10% discount needs to get approval with a senior vice president. Oftentimes in, in that industry, what we see, it, it, those discounts look very different in foreign operations and you need to have the same kind of discipline and metric involved so that it doesn't look like the 25% discount, which may be completely normal in a place like Turkey, you, you set your prices high where my family's from, you set your prices high so you can negotiate. Well, you know, a 40% discount is normal there, but if you don't have a policy um, about that or a you know matrix for that, then what it looks like is it may look like it's a bribe because you're giving a larger discount or a larger concession. Great. Well, look, we uh, we have enjoyed being with you this morning. If you have any follow up, feel free to call uh, contact any one of us. Uh, and uh, hopefully next time you'll make uh, to our live uh, audience uh, by invitation uh, and have some opportunity to have a private consult with us, which we're happy to do with Junaid in town today and Dan and myself. Uh, uh, we're happy to host you here, give you nice food, give you a private consultation free for the day so <laughs> hey thanks so much all right all right hey we'll see you next time